Welcome to Public Health IT. This will be a lecture on public health-enabled electronic health records, decision support, and their role in the meaningful use of healthcare technology. This is Lecture B. Here is a quick reminder of the objectives from the prior lecture. Number one, discuss the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene partnership with a commercial EHR vendor and how it created a public health-enabled EHR. And two, describe the EHR meaningful use movement and how it could transform existing clinical public health practices. The learning objectives for the public health-enabled electronic health records, decision support, and their role in the meaningful use of healthcare technology unit are, number one, Demonstrate knowledge of public health-oriented clinical decision support, including an integrated strategy using multiple tools, such as alerts, order sets, smart forms, and quality reporting. Number two, describe the strategies, features, and systems needed for public health agencies to define and build the necessary connections to EHRs, as identified by the Meaningful Use legislation and three, identify the essential features of four primary public health IT functions, including syndromic surveillance, bidirectional immunization registries, public health alerts, ad hoc reporting, etc. How can we meet all of these amazing meaningful use goals? How can we possibly expect busy providers to focus on the health of the population at the same time that they're treating their patients in the clinic? The avenue we suggest is that vendors enable their EHRs to focus on public health priorities, thus creating a public health-enabled EHR. A number of these features can be found in existing EHR products throughout the market space. But here in particular, we are going to focus on eight key features from the system that's been in use with the Primary Care Information Project that we helped to design into the product so that our patient population would be better served by a clinically focused pursuit of public health. The features that we will discuss are first, measure reports, second, enhanced registry, third, automatic visual alerts, fourth, clinical decision support or CDSS, five, quick orders, six, comprehensive order sets, seven, CIR and school health, and eight, medication history. What are each of these features? We are going to use the following storyline to illustrate how these public health enabled EHR features can be used in clinical care. We will be using a hypothetical patient, Jane Doe, a 48 year old woman who is being cared for by her family practitioner, Dr. Sam Willis. Dr. Sam Willis wants to find out how he is doing caring for his patients. He's a good doctor. He wants to see what's going on with his practice so he occasionally goes to look at his quality measure reports. The quality measure report feature allows him to look up and see a measurement of blood pressure control for his patients that are 18 to 75 years of age, with a diagnosis of hypertension and no diagnosis of IVD or diabetes. So if he runs that report, he finds that only 7 out of 18 of his patients are in control. Well, that's not so good. 38%. That's not where he wants to be. So he clicks on the list and drills down and sees list of patients. Those in black are not in control, so he realizes that he needs to do some follow-up work. He decides to have Jane Doe come in for a follow-up visit. But before Dr. Willis brings Jane Doe in for the follow-up visit, he wishes to get a more in-depth look at the patient's characteristics with hypertension by looking at the Enhanced Registry feature. This enhanced registry tool allows Dr. Willis to browse the clinical characteristics of his entire patient population. In this case, he is looking at patients greater than 18 years of age, both sexes, looking at those that have an ICD-9 code of 401.9 and a blood pressure value greater than 140 over 90. This tool produces a list of patients with these conditions. Jane Doe topping the list. In addition to being able to explore this panel of patients, it allows him to generate letters based upon predefined templates that can be sent out to bring the patient back in for a follow-up visit. This is a powerful tool that allows a provider to look across all of the patients that he normally only sees one at a time. 
In this manner, he can look at them in a new way and say, overall, am I treating my diabetics well? Am I treating my hypertensive patients well? It is yet another one of those tools that Dr. Willis can use to meaningfully treat and bring better health to his patient population. So Jane Doe receives the letter and makes the follow-up appointment. And during the visit, Dr. Willis's assistant takes her history and vitals. Jane mentions that she has had a few weeks of excessive thirst and fatigue. So that's all documented in her clinical note here. So unfortunately for Jane, her blood pressure is elevated. It's 150 over 90, and it shows up in red. So we see that already the EHR is alerting the provider just with a little color change that this particular patient may need additional follow-up care. It also provides features of trending over time. So if the doctor wants to look at how Jane has been doing over multiple visits, you can see that her blood pressure is just not in a good range. Based upon this, the doctor also wants to be able to address all of her additional complaints. On questioning Jane about her excessive thirst, Dr. Willis performs a finger stick test and confirms his suspicion that yes, Jane has diabetes. So Dr. Willis enters the diagnosis of diabetes into the EHR. Once he has done that, additional decision support alerts pop up on the right panel, identifying preventative services that should be done for Jane based on her particular conditions. Fortunately, Dr. Willis agrees with these alert suggestions for Jane, and he can readily click on the pre-built quick orders. Jane needs a hemoglobin A1C test, so he clicks on the drop-down menu and with one additional click drops that over into the medical record as a follow-up test. And once that is done, Dr. Willis will have satisfied and done appropriate follow-up care for this particular patient, which would now show up in his quality reports as well. Dr. Willis may also choose to use additional order sets that can be linked to do a complete follow-up for a patient with a particular condition. These order sets have all the right information at one place, including medications, lab tests, procedures, immunizations, patient education material, and so on. Since she is there, Jane also asks her doctor for a school health form for her five-year-old Tim, who is entering daycare. Dr. Willis is able to print a preloaded New York City school health form from the screen here. Incidentally, the EHR also sends all immunization information automatically to the Citywide Immunization Registry, CIR, which maintains a complete record of Tim's immunizations. Finally, Dr. Willis decides he should do a little more follow-up work by checking Jane's medication regimen to monitor her lipid control. He can do this more thoroughly by finding out the medications that have been filled for her elsewhere. Jane signs a consent form and allows him to query the medication history function, which is able to retrieve prescription fill histories from her commercial insurance company. He realizes she has not been filling her lipid medication for the past three months, and she admits that she stopped taking them because she'd wondered if the tiredness she'd felt was due to the pills, when in fact it had to do with her undiagnosed diabetes. So, all these system features have helped to facilitate bringing a patient from the community back to the clinic to have an effective examination which resulted in better clinical care of many patient conditions. These are the type of functions and features that the Primary Care Information Project has developed and integrated to meet both clinical and public health goals. While the features discussed so far represent meaningful advances for public health, there are now additional features that the Office of the National Coordinator and the Centers for Medicaid would like physicians to use on a regular basis in their EHRs to improve public health. If they do, they will receive additional incentive payments from the Meaningful Use legislation. The final segment of this unit will cover these public health meaningful use functions. In November 2008, PCIP and eClinical Works built a syndromic surveillance feature into their EHR system. The focus was on a number of syndromic definitions such as influenza-like illness, fever, and gastrointestinal illness. These definitions were encoded as database queries that ran on each practice's system on a nightly basis. The final result counts were then securely transmitted as a text file to PCIP's secure servers. Why do we do syndromic surveillance exactly? 
The short answer is that we are looking for signals of potential illness in a community before we know the actual number of confirmed cases. Influenza is one disease that we continually track throughout the year. It is important to know when to marshal resources to begin vaccinations and to identify potential new outbreaks. A syndromic surveillance system looks for signals of influenza in medical records. Here, for example, if we look in the chief complaints section, we have a patient that has a cough and a fever. This is a potential signal. We know that if you have the flu, you may have a cough and or a fever. So, if we count out this patient as well as patients like him across a community, we may have a signal as to when flu season may start. When we collect the syndromic data or count data across a community, we're only collecting counts of patients that may have conditions and not actual patient information. We receive a file such as is shown here with a facility ID identifying where the information came from, what measurements we're looking at, such as fever syndrome for patients that had a fever. We have a report date and an age group breakdown so we know which patients may be getting sick, whether it's concentrated in adults or perhaps in children. If we look at the fourth line down, at the all ages age group, we have a patient numerator of one and a patient denominator of nine. So there were nine patients seen by the physician on that day and one of them had influenza-like symptoms. Combining these counts across all our community of practices, we have the following seven-day average graph that gives us a signal as to how the course of influenza proceeds across the flu season and if significant enough, may help us predict when a new outbreak is starting. For example, if we look at the graph from early February of 2009 to the end of December 2009, we see that in the summertime there was a pronounced spike, particularly in young kids. This is actually a graph of the 2009 H1N1 influenza outbreak in New York City and illustrates how this type of information might be used by public health investigators to compare with past years when monitoring for new potential outbreaks. Here we see the same 2009 H1N1 data combined into one graph which shows the outbreak spiking around May, throughout June and dropping back down in July. Combining these signals with additional data sources from lab results and emergency department data gives health departments the ability to track disease in the community. We have shown here how information captured during the normal course of clinical care for a patient coming in with a chief complaint of a fever and a cough might be used to create an aggregate count across a community, which can be graphed and statistically measured to find potentially significant spikes during the outbreak of a new disease. That is a meaningful use of electronic health record technology. This lecture has shown that a combination of measure reports, registry tool, visual alerts, clinical decision support, order sets, CIR, and medication history all enable a clinical provider to practice good preventative follow-up care in line with public health priorities. It has also shown how EHR data could be used to detect the H1N1 flu outbreak in New York City.